everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I'll be hanging out with you today as we wrap up our Getting Started series. The topic for the day is going to be ecosystems, so like always, let me get your objectives and we'll get going. Today, I need you to be able to understand the basic components of an ecosystem, explain the link between photosynthesis and respiration, discuss GPP and NPP, and describe trophic efficiency in an ecosystem. So we got a lot of stuff to cover today. Let's get going. We'll start out by talking about an ecosystem and what an ecosystem is. Now, an ecosystem, technically defined, is a particular location shaped by many biotic and abiotic factors. Now, remember, the biotic factors of an ecosystem are going to be all the living things like the plants, the animals, the fungi, the microbes, all that good stuff. The abiotic factors are temperature, the amount of oxygen, pH of the soil, um, composition of the water, all of that is the... Uh, abiotic factors. Every ecosystem is going to have a very particular set of plants and animals that live there. So just know that ecosystems can be large or they can be very small. You can think of your shoe as an ecosystem because it's a particular place with its particular set of microbes, li microbes living in it, or you could think of the Amazon rainforest as being an ecosystem. So ecosystems are combinations of abiotic and biotic factors interacting together to produce a unique place. One of the difficulties with ecosystems is defining the boundaries. Now, there are some ecosystems that the boundaries are super well defined, like a cave. Once you are inside the walls of the cave, you are within that ecosystem. And for scientists, it's very easy to study because they know, all right, if I'm studying the cave ecosystem, as long as I'm within those walls, I'm good to go. Other ecosystems, like, say, a forest, a rainforest, or a river right here, is a very difficult to set clean boundaries on because you kind of transition and fade from one ecosystem into the next as you move across the land. And a lot of times humans will try to draw artificial boundaries like Yellowstone National Park here in America. They drew a boundary around a set area and they said, all right, this is the Yellowstone ecosystem. But then they realized, oh wait, bears and wolves and stuff are moving in and out of the boundaries of the park. They don't care. So they actually ended up expanding the boundaries of what they call the Yellowstone ecosystem because they realized that animals were moving back and forth all the time. So some ecosystems like a cave or your shoe has very clearly defined boundaries, but most ecosystems, it's hard to say this is where one stops and the next begins. One of the defining characteristics of an ecosystem, and this is where we're going to spend the rest of our video, is on energy flow. Um, energy flow, as we'll find out in a few moments, is just the flow of energy from the sun all the way through the ecosystem and back again. It all runs in a cycle, and I'm not going to say much more than that because we're going to talk about it a lot. Before we start talking about the actual energy flow, though, we need to talk about the start of the system. And you need to be very aware of the fact that photosynthesis and cellular respiration rely on one another. Now, I find that most students are very familiar with photosynthesis. That's the process of plants using sunlight and carbon dioxide to produce oxygen and sugar. Cellular respiration is one that um, scientists, unless they've, or not scientists, students, unless they have had biology, have a hard time with. That is us staying alive. That is any animal taking in food, using that food to go about their daily activities, and then expelling carbon dioxide. So let me kind of note a couple things on the diagram here. In photosynthesis, you want to notice last video we talked about inputs and outputs. So for photosynthesis, the input is carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. Your output is oxygen and glucose. And the way this is set up is awesome because if you're talking about cellular respiration, that would be keeping us alive. The input is oxygen and glucose, and the output is energy, carbon dioxide, and water. So if you notice, our outputs are the inputs for photosynthesis, and the outputs of photosynthesis are the inputs for cellular respiration. So this little cycle is the perfect little cycle that keeps the world functioning, essentially, or at least the living world. As we talk about energy flowing through a system, um, most students are usually pretty familiar with the idea of a food chain. That's just basically who eats who within an ecosystem. You do need to know that food chains are organized according to trophic levels. Trophic level is basically the level at which an organism is feeding. So the bottom of the food pyramid is always the producer. These are the autotrophs, the plants or the algae that conduct photosynthesis and can make their own food. Everything above the producer is not capable of making its own food. So producers are eaten by 
primary consumers. Primary consumers are eaten by secondary consumers, which are eaten by tertiary consumers. In a terrestrial food chain, so this would be on land, grasses, plants, shrubs are usually the producers on the bottom. In an aquatic food chain, algae are generally the producers. So here's a food chain. Remember, producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, they all rely on each other. And energy flows from one to the next, the original energy source being the green sun that I've just drawn. Within an ecosystem, you also need to know that most feeding relationships and energy transfer relationships are very complex. It's not like you've just got this nice neat chain where one animal only eats one other type of animal and so on and so forth. In the real world, things are way more complex than that and a food web illustrates all of the complexities in the real world. So down here, you've got your producers. That's the same, you got your grasses down here. But then from there, you have got rabbits eating the grasses, cheetahs eating the rabbits, you have got uh, cheetahs and gazelles having a feeding relationship, you've got zebras and lions having a feeding relationship, along with hyenas, and you've got the dead wildebeest over here. So you've got everybody kind of interacting with everybody else. And there's a couple of components on here that don't show up on a normal food chain. Um, within a food web, you've got scavengers, detritivores, and decomposers. So a scavenger obviously is going to be anything that comes along and feeds on a dead animal. So that would be things like hyenas and vultures. They don't necessarily kill their own food. They just find the leftovers from other organisms. Then you've got the detritivores. Detritivores are going to be things like this little beetle right here. They feed on the waste given off by other animals. They also feed on dead carcasses. They feed on detritus. That is stuff that has been left behind. And then the final step of the cycle is our decomposer. Decomposers are bacteria, fungi, worms, things that finish the final breakdown. And they kind of complete the cycle with the nutrients that came from the grass going back into the ground. So without scavengers, detritivores, and decomposers, nothing in the world would ever break down, and the nutrients from those things would never be cycled back into the ecosystem. So they're quite, quite important. Ecosystem productivity is something that we need to measure because it talks about the total amount of energy produced within an ecosystem. So when we talk about ecosystem productivity, we're talking about plants, and we're talking about the amount of energy that they actually take from the sun and turn into sugars that other organisms are able to use. The reason that the productivity of the ecosystem is important is because this determines how many animals can live in an ecosystem. The higher the pro productivity, obviously, the more organisms that can live there. So. When scientists are talking about primary productivity, they talk about two terms. The first is gross primary productivity, that is GPP. The second is net primary productivity. And let me talk about these two terms. So gross primary productivity is the total amount of energy taken in by photosynthesizing plants and turned into sugar. So you can see right here on our diagram, of all of the energy coming in from the sun, 99% is lost. That 1% is actually, or the remaining 1% is actually used by plants. Now, plants take that sunlight in, they use it to photosynthesize, they make sugars, they go through their natural processes. But the interesting thing is, of all of this um, sugar that is created, 60% of it is actually used up by the plant to stay alive because when it's dark, plants can't make their own food, so they need sugars to stay alive. Whatever is left over is actually incorporated into the body of the plants and is available for whatever consumer might eat that plant. So gross primary productivity is the total amount of sugar made by the plant. Net primary productivity is whatever is left over after the plant has used the needed energy to stay alive. So net primary productivity is equal to gross primary productivity. That would be the total amount of sugar made minus whatever is used up by the plant itself. And this net primary productivity, this is the number that is used to talk about how productive an ecosystem is and how many organisms that it is able to support. So one of the challenges to determining the gross primary productivity is that it's hard to, you can't ask a plant, say, hey, how much carbon did you make today? So uh, scientists have to do some calculations to figure this out. And the best way that they can 
figure out how much photosynthesis a plant is going through is to measure how much carbon dioxide it is using because ultimately it's the carbon dioxide that is taken in and turned into sugar. So the way they calculate this is kind of difficult because plants are both taking in carbon dioxide and giving off carbon dioxide at the same time so it's hard to say exactly how much they're using. So what a scientist will usually do is they take a, take a plant and they put it in the dark. In the dark, obviously, it's not going through photosynthesis. So while that plant is in the dark, they measure how much carbon dioxide is given off. That kind of gives them a baseline to say, all right, our plant gives off this much carbon dioxide. They then put it out in the light, and they measure how much carbon dioxide is actually consumed by that plant. Because as it's going through photosynthesis, it's going to pull in carbon dioxide. So what they do is they take the amount of carbon dioxide that the plant sucked in. So let's say that our plant, as it was sitting out in the sunlight, doing its photosynthesis, sucked in 100 grams of carbon. The night before, when the scientists were working on that plant, maybe they figured out <clears throat> that the plant gives off 30 grams. So this would mean that it takes in 100, it gives off 30, put these together, our primary productivity is 70 grams. All right, so this is one of the calculations that scientists use to determine the gross primary productivity. Comparing ecosystems, the most productive ecosystems on the terrestrial side of the earth, so that would be on land, are swamps and marshes followed by rainforests, and in the water, the most productive is a coral reef followed by a salt marsh. These places have got a lot of water, they got a lot of sunlight, they've got good warm temperatures, so they have the highest rates of productivity. We're going to start bringing it home. This is probably your last slide for the day. So talking about all of that productivity, energy is transferred from one level to the next in the food chain we just talked about. You've got your producers, your primary consumers, your secondary consumers. You need to be very familiar with how much energy is actually transmitted from one level of the pyramid to the next. <clears throat> By nature of the law, the second law of thermodynamics, remember the second law of thermodynamics, energy quality is lost as it changes forms. Because of this rule, only about, and there's a number you need to know, 10% of energy is transferred from one level of the trophic pyramid to the next. So our producers right here, they might produce 10,000 joules of energy. That would be their gross primary productivity. But as they use their uh, sugars that they make in order to keep themselves alive, the zebra that eats that... Um, grass only gets 1,000 joules of the energy. So 90% of the energy was lost at this level, which means that only 10% can be transferred up into our zebra. Our zebra has to go through its normal processes of walking around the savanna, eating, staying alive. So as it uses this 1,000 joules of energy, there is only 100 joules left for the lion that comes along to eat that zebra. And then if something were, let's say a human comes along to eat the lion, out of this 100 joules, there would only be 10 joules left for whatever it is that eats the lion. So 10% makes it from one to the next. Um, these pyramids are generally a representation of biomass. So a biomass is basically all the living matter in an area. If you think about an ecosystem, this makes sense because you look around and you see plants and trees and stuff everywhere. So there are tons and tons of producers. You see fewer zebras and gazelles and primary consumers, and you only see a couple lions because there is only so much energy to go from one level to the next. So biggest level can support a smaller level, which supports a smaller level. And I think that's all we got for the day. Thanks for tracking with us. This has been the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.